Well, thanks. It's good to be here with all of you this morning and see your smiling faces hiding behind masks again. Um, but it is good. This process for me has been one that has taken seven months. Uh, I applied for this role back in March. Um, and, you know, through the various processes, this is where we are today. And so it's kind of neat, and it's a bit of a surreal experience to be here in front of you today, but I'm glad that we are at this point. And it's, uh, again, it's great to be up here today. Um, they say there are two things that you should never do in a job interview. And for me, this is a job interview. You guys are just here to do church, but like I have something I'm doing this morning here. So there's two things you should never do in a job interview. They tell you one of those things is you should never talk about religion. And the other one is you should never talk about politics. And with the federal election tomorrow and being that I'm here to speak about religion, I'm in a bit of a precarious position. So I'm going to break at least one of those rules this morning, and I'm actually going to break another one. It is my baby girl's birthday this morning, and she is not here at church, but I wanted to say happy birthday, Capri. She's turning five this morning, so we're just breaking all the rules, but um, we'll see you soon, sweetheart. Uh, when I was in high school and junior high, uh, the band program our school was, was a very successful band program. There's a lot of students in it, mostly, mo probably half the school attended band. And I loved playing band. I played trombone, and eventually, because I was so skilled and so gifted, they allowed me to play the bass trombone. And that was like the cream of the crop for me, because it was the lowest sounding instrument in the stage band, which eventually I was a part of. And we would meet, you know, at 7 o'clock, 7 30 in the morning on some school days to play in the, in the stage band. And I really enjoyed that time. There was one, uh, one thing that I loved about the bass trombone was these deep low notes that you could play and how it would round out the sound of the band. You know, it, it never sounded good until the bass trombone was playing. At least that was my opinion. <laughs> We had the opportunity one time to play a jazz concert for a group of people for a, a dinner jazz festival. And before everybody showed up, we were practicing as a band. And I remember this one song. The band loved it. And you could tell they loved it because all, we all just played our hearts out. And I remember blowing as hard as I could through that bass trombone. And you could barely hear me over how loud the rest of this band was playing. And it was awesome. And I enjoyed it. And I remember after the song was over, the band teacher wiggling his ears just to let us know, like, guys, that was way too loud. Like, we cannot do this when there's people in the room. They had a decibel meter in the room, and I guess we hit a, around 120 decibels. And for those of you who know anything about decibels, and I didn't, we looked this up, 120 decibels is like right around aircraft taking off. So this is loud stuff, but we really enjoyed it. I love the instrument and the way music comes together when you have different parts. You know, if you play the trombone on its own, it doesn't sound that spectacular. But when you play it with all the rest of the instruments and all of that comes together, you get this beautiful sound and there's harmonies and there's music. And so I love how when a band plays, you get to have that, those melodies and those harmonies come together. It's something I always enjoyed. Over the past several weeks, we have been talking about what it means to be a courageous community. And a few weeks ago, um, Pastor Dave spoke about what it looks like to be a spiritual community. And last week, Sid spoke to us about how we need to fight for harmony. This week, we're going to be going through 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 26. So if you wanted to look that up in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 26. And if you don't know where that is in your Bible, or, or pull it up on your, your app, I should say, as well, on your tablet. If you don't know where that is, 1 Corinthians is in about the middle of the New Testament. And just a little head nod to my potential future boss. The uh, big numbers are the chapter numbers, and the small numbers are the verse numbers. <laughs> As we continue to study what it means to live out courageous community, these passages in 1 Corinthians are for us. The Apostle Paul, who is the author of this letter, is famous for how he taught the early church what it was like to live out what Jesus taught and how Jesus lived. And in this passage, he is teaching the church how to function as a community in the context of Jesus. If you were told if I were to tell you today that you need to live like Jesus in community, your next question would be, well, how do I do that? This passage that Paul was, has written would answer that question for you. 
The history of the Corinthian church is this. Corinth was this multicultural city, not unlike what we have here in Canada today. It was a melting pot of many nationalities uh, coming together. It was a trade city built on this narrow peninsula um, where there was a port on one side and a port on the other, and the ports connected the Gulf of Corinth and the Ionian Sea with the Aegean Sea. And its trade made it a place of wealth. Corinth was a wealthy city. There were slaves and there were free people there, but there was a lot of people who got wealthy in Corinth. So people wanted to come to Corinth. And as a result, you had all these cultures and all these religions coming together. And when they came together, they blended some of these things. And that blending caused a lot of moral failings and some weird moral judgments to take place. Um, the morality in Corinth was so low, they actually coined the phrase Corinthianized. So somebody who had a particularly uh, you know, promiscuous lifestyle or a particularly uh, low morality, they would say, you have been Corinthianized. This is the setting that the Corinthian church was founded in by the Apostle Paul. It was a multicultural church of Jews and non-Jews from all over the world, essentially coming together as believers but because of the diversity of their surrounding community and the culture, the church was in trouble within a few years of its inception. Prom promiscuity, divorce, lawsuits, factions, and general immorality were plaguing this group of people. And in addition to this, some of the people were given the gift of speaking in tongues. Instead of using this gift to serve the body, which is why God gives us spiritual gifts, these people were using these spiritual gifts to prop themselves up and make themselves look good. They had elevated the status of this gift above other gifts, creating this sort of elitism for this more flamboyant spiritual gift. To the Corinthians, speaking in tongues was their confirmation that the Spirit of God was on them. And so they felt that gave them permission to put other spiritual gifts that you didn't notice as much down. They were viewed as a lower caliber than this one. So when Paul writes this letter, these are the things that are going on in the background as he writes this letter to the Corinthians. And when we approach chapter 12, he is specifically dealing with how this church is supposed to function as a community. So let's pick this up in chapter 12, verse 12. Just as the body, or just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. Paul begins by using this analogy of a body to demonstrate how the diverse parts come together and they work in unity. And when I think about this, I think of a gymnast, like a gymnast to do all the flips and the acrobatic things that they do and make these jumps. A gymnast body has to work together. All of the parts have to work in unity. Or I think of a dancer. Uh, not me, because when, when I dance, it, there's, there's nothing. All you see is the diverse parts. Just ask my wife. But when a, a normal person dances anyway, all of those diverse parts as they work and move with the music work together to form unity in this body. Paul was forming this discussion this way for these people because he was setting the Corinthians up. The Corinthian church was a divided community. One of the group, or some of the group followed one guy's teaching, another group followed another guy's teaching, and yet some of them still followed Paul. And they all sat around, and all they did was argue about who was right and what was this, and they just had a bunch of fighting. They were supposed to be one, but they were divided, and each faction became like a social club. It was like the cool kids versus the nerds. And this is what, what the church wasn't supposed to be like. And speaking about cool kids, I, I, I'm reminded of a story last year when I was driving to work and I came across this kid. It was minus 20 degrees outside and blowing snow. And this kid's walking to school with no coat on and short sleeve shirt. I'm like, what is going through this guy's head? He obviously thought he was too cool for a jacket and so he didn't need one. <laughs> but I, I'm looking at that in my toque in my car with my heater on and I'm going, I think I need to call a counselor for this kid. This is where he doesn't feel anything. But the truth is, this is what was going on in the Corinthian church. They thought they were cool. There was nothing that had told them they were and they were making decisions based on that. There are many people in this church who are, who are treating their gifts in a very self-righteous way. They were given spiritual gifts, and those less, less showy gifts were marginalized. Now for us, we look at this a couple of thousand years later, and we're like, man, these guys weren't, they didn't know what they were doing. Why were they doing that? We know that it was wrong. We can see that. But we need to remember that this was an early Christian church. 
Jesus had died only 20 or 25 years earlier than this. And so these people, this Christian community was trying to figure out how to operate and how to, how to be a Christian community. So Paul sets them up here so that they can see how far they need to go before they will be functioning in community the way that God had designed them and the way that Jesus modeled it. At the end of verse 12, Paul, Paul remarks, so it is with Christ. And I think this is an interesting statement because if I was writing this book, I would say, so it is with the church. But Paul doesn't do that. He says, so it is with Christ. And I wonder why he does that. And the truth is, there's something amazing behind why he says it this way. Mark Clark is the senior pastor of the Village Church out in Surrey, BC. And he says this about that statement. Paul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 was so formative to his understanding of Jesus and the church that he can't separate the two anymore. They are inexplicably linked. And I know most of us are familiar with the story of Paul who used to be Saul of Tarsus. But Saul was this very religious man who knew a lot about the scriptures. He was a Pharisee and he persecuted Christians. This is what he did. He knew the law and he followed it closely and the Christians didn't quite line up to that. And he, we actually have a, record, uh, a record in the Bible of him being present during the martyr of the first Christian, Stephen. And so Paul goes to the temple and he gets permission from the priest and he says, I, I want to go persecute some more people. I'm sure he didn't say it exactly like that, but that's what was going on. They gave him letters and permission to go to these other towns and to persecute in these towns. And as he's on his way to Damascus on one of these journeys, he encounters the reincarnated Jesus. And Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? He doesn't say that. He says, why are you persecuting me? And I think what's going on here is that Jesus and the church are linked, are linked and there's nothing that can separate them. And this was a, such a formative moment in Paul's theology that he understands that God cannot be separated from his church. So when Paul says to the Corinthian church, so, so it is with Christ, he is drawing out the point, not for dramatic effect. He isn't trying to drag out the message and get, hit him with a punchline later. No, he is letting them know that the church is Christ's and Christ is the church. And the way they're operating in this body is not how it's supposed to be. And this sets um, the ground and the context for the rest of the passage. In verse 13, we go on to read, For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. This is the context that he's speaking to. Jews and Gentiles, slave and free, they were together here in Corinth. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. We are one. This isn't a group over here and a group over there. There is one spirit one God, God is one. He is not divided against himself. The Trinity has functioned with all of its diversity in perfect unity since for all eternity. We don't have any record or any inkling in the Bible that there is any kind of tension in the Trinity. And it's probably a good thing because if there was, it would be like a cosmic battle and it would probably end the earth. <laughs> but that's not what happens. My kids in the back of the car can't make it three minutes in unity before there's all kinds of fighting. But that just shows you the difference between a perfect and divine united God and our fallen sinful humanity. But that's not the way it was supposed to be or where, the way it should be. And Paul is sharing here that every believer is baptized into this union. So as we believe and as we as believers accept Christ, we get to be a part of that unity. A part of that unity is in us as it is with Christ. But this is not how it was going in the Corinthian church. And this isn't what they were believing. They were denying the unity that they had been given in Jesus. Paul goes on to write in verses 14 through 17. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye... I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? The body requires diversity working together in order to function. 
Now, we just had the summer 2020 Olympic Games, and I know what you're thinking. Oh, great, you know, like 2020 was such a party. Let's bring it on back for a little more celebration, right? <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> but the thing about the Olympic Games is, is when one of our athletes would come up on the stage and accept a medal, they didn't go to that athlete, figure out what part of their body was the most important part in the race or in the competition and give, that part of, give the medal to that part of their body. That's not what is going on. They would give it to the athlete. No one part of the body claims the medal. It's understood. We don't need to talk about it. Everybody knows that when an athlete wins the medal, the medal goes to the athlete. The whole body is a part of training and must be conditioned together. The bicep isn't responsible for winning a weightlifting challenge. We all know it's the muscles, it's the skin, it's the brain, it's the bones. All of that working together in perfect unity to make the list or the lift. The body of Christ is the same. It is diverse and, and all of its parts are important. You can't simply remove one part of the body and it not suffer. You can't pluck out your eyeballs and still expect your body to work the same. It will not be the same. Nor can a part of your body just decide one day, I don't want to be an arm. And I'm not, <laughs> it doesn't work like that in the body and it's not going to work like that in the body of Christ. In verse 18, we discover the main point here. And this is the point Paul is trying to drive home. Courageous communities are designed to be diverse by the Father. This was a foundational thought to the Corinthians because it meant that anyone who tried to mess with the diversity in the church by looking down on other gifts or by fighting against unity was messing with the very plan of God. Verse 18 starts with, but in fact, God. And the word in Greek here is nuni, which is N-Y-N-I. And the Corinthians would have heard him say this and they would have understood that, the, that what he was saying was, look, this is the way it is. Whatever you've been doing in the past, no, this is the way it is. And he says, but in fact, God has placed the parts of the body. Every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Paul's point to the Corinthians was that their diversity was not a result of them living in a multicultural city. Nor was it the result of a bunch of random gifts coming together. No, it was the result of the divine and the work of the Father. This is a concept that isn't just relevant for them. This is actually relevant for us today. As we, as we live out courageous community, we need to be aware that this community, Ellerslie Road Baptist Church, is the design of the Father. And I think we can draw a lot of strength from that. Uh, we're not alone in the mission that he's put in front of us as a church body, and he is with us in that. This is his design with these people. In about the 1800s, a gentleman by the name, a missionary named Hudson Taylor, uh, went and did inland mission in China. And he coined the phrase, God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. This is a man who at great personal cost to himself and his family served the mission of Christ in inland China. And he would pray, God, we need more missionaries. And he would boldly pray, we need a hundred more. And God would give him a hundred more. God, we need 200 more. And God would give him more. And he got to see God's supply affect God's mission. God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. God's design is sufficient to fulfill the mission. In our church, we have been blessed with a significant amount of diversity. We have many people in our church with many gifts from all over the region. As a matter of fact, we have people from all over the world. And this is amazing because we get a picture, a snapshot, a bigger snapshot in a bigger church of what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like one day. But the greater the diversity, the greater the mission. Which means we need to be on point in our understanding about diversity in the body. The diversity in our body is the design of the Father for his specific purpose. In fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. This is the prerogative of God, and we don't get to mess with that. That is his design. Our role in all of this is to discover where we fit in the body and then work together to accomplish the mission. This brings me to our second point, which is courageous communities serve the body. 
Uh, the natural inclination of most of us when we're given a gift or we have a gift is to use that gift for ourselves. In 2003, there was a movie that came out called Bruce Almighty. Many of you have probably seen it. Uh, Jim Carrey plays in it, and he's Bruce. And Bruce is a news uh, reporter, and he's been passed over and over and over again for promotion. And him and this guy named Evan are in competition for this other anchor position. And Evan ends up getting the job. And so Bruce is angry, and he takes it out on the news when he's on live camera. And as a result, he loses his job. And when he's heading out of his office with his box of stuff, he gets mugged. And he's having this lousy day, and all these terrible things are happening. And he's blaming God, and it's all God's fault that bad things happen in the world. And so he says to God, I could do it better than you. And God shows up and gives him the opportunity to do it better and empowers him with all of his gifts and all of his power for a few days. And so Bruce does what any of us would do or most of us would do. He takes and he serves himself. He makes his car better. He parts traffic when he needs to drive through. Uh, he gets his job back, the job that he wanted because of all these amazing events that he creates to happen when he just so happens to be there covering a more mundane story. He, there's, a, there's a scene with him sitting over top of a bowl of soup, parting it with his hands, <laughs> hearkening back to when Moses and the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. After a while, God shows up and says, you know, like, you're not doing my job. And so as Bruce tries to fulfill God's job, he realizes this is a really big job. And he says, this is going to suck up my whole life. And yeah, the job of God is very self-serving to everyone around them. And so Bruce knew he couldn't do it. But in a courageous community, we aren't afraid to use our gifts to serve the body. We can embrace this radical idea of serving one another, even at the expense of ourselves, which means using our gifts. Paul says in Corinthians 9, 19, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. That's not what Bruce was doing. But that's what the Apostle Paul is saying we need to do. This is the example that Jesus set for us. And this is how he has designed the church to work. There should be no elitism in regard to our different gifts because each gift is designed to serve the body in its own way. Each part is an integral part of community needed to achieve the mission. Verses 21 and 25 say, The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for one another. Paul is laying it all out here for the Corinthians. Their elitism regarding their gifts was incorrect. The gifts of tongues that they had had and made them look so spiritual and so wonderful in their community was supposed to be used to serve the body. And what Paul is saying here is the parts that you guys thought were so important and so amazing, you're wrong. It's the parts that you couldn't see the parts that you weren't, the parts that you weren't giving credit to, those are the vital parts, the vital organs. They are the heart. They are the lungs of the body. They might not be visible, but these are the things that are necessary to survive. God has masterfully designed diversity into his plan to create unity in the body. Now think about that for a second. God takes all these random things and when God takes all these random things and he puts them together, it can create unity. And I think of a song and how the different parts, like I was sharing the trombone on its own, it's kind of like, well, it sounds all right. But when you put it together, it makes sense and it works and it makes this beautiful song. Maybe you're not a music person. So think of the universe. All the different parts of the cosmos, the chaos that goes on and the spinning and the, the, the planets but somehow when God brings that all together in his hands, it forms this perfect unity and a stable system. Now let me just raise our gaze for a minute. Our church has three strategic directions. We have a discipleship journey, a young family focus, and we have intentional missional groups. 
What happens to the success of that mission that God has given us when we all work together using our gifts and we function in unity as a body? I'll tell you what I think is ha what happen. We become a place that is unmistakably family focused. People will notice the difference in how we treat families and how families are viewed here. And they'll go, man, Ellerslie sure gets families, understands families. But it won't be that we understand families so much more than anyone else. It'll be that we understand the mission that God has given us and how our gifts function together within the church community to accomplish that mission. We'll also experience an increase in the people growing and be di being discipled. People will know Ellerslie is a place where they can be discipled exposing the parts of their life to Jesus and experiencing the real life change. And people will also come to know Jesus as we share in our communities about him. That is what can happen if we work together using all of our gifts for the mission that God has laid in front of us. But it's also what is at stake if we don't get it right. Now, maybe you look at this plan and you go, I'm old. I'm out, it's, it, it, the mission isn't for me. Or maybe you're really young and you go, I don't know how a young family focus affects me. This passage should encourage you that it has everything to do with you. God has assembled this church with your gifts and these facilities and the rest of this, these people to achieve this mission, which means we all have a role to play in this mission. Where do you fit in it? Are you a prayer warrior? Maybe you can't come out to events anymore, but you are behind the scenes praying, petitioning the Lord for this body and for this mission. Maybe you're a planner and you love to plan. And so you're planning events and uh, uh, projects. Or maybe you're uh, somebody who likes to work behind the scenes. And so you serve your heart out behind the scenes, helping things so that they're ready to go and the ministry is ready to take place. Or maybe you're an evangelizer and you can't stop telling people about Jesus and you're always inviting them to, Ellers, or to, to Alpha. Or maybe you're a family and maybe your family can do something together. How has God gifted you as a couple or as a family or as a group of friends? What do you have together that you can bring and share in the mission together with our church. What a testament to our kids if as a family we serve together towards a mission for God. No gift is less valuable than another and no gift should be left on the shelf. We are called to action in these passages and there's no mission that you can, or pardon me, we are called to action in these passages and there is a mission that you can literally or figuratively have a hand in. If you're not sure where you can have a hand, I would encourage you to seek that out. Perhaps one of the most courageous things that you will do this week is trying to figure out and pray through where you fit in the mission that God has put in front of this church and then contact the church and try to get involved in that or talk to somebody about it. I'm sure um, after the service, the staff would love to hear from you um, and get you connected in something. But this is what it's all about, us coming together using our gifts. This brings me to our third point. Courageous communities are together through thick and thin. Paul writes in verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We are connected in this body and that should bring about a mutual concern for one another. We all serve the same God. We serve the same Jesus and are on the same mission. So when one part, one part of us suffers, we all suffer. And when one part of us is honored, we all celebrate that. When it comes to suffering, uh, there's many ways that we can suffer. We're not unfamiliar with this. Loss of employment, loss of health, loss of a loved one, relationship trials, mental health issues, sin. All of these cause suffering in our lives but I want to focus on sin for a little bit because sin has the power to destroy us and significantly hurt the body. The Corinthian church was suffering with its sin. They had factions. They kept fighting amongst themselves. And this fighting made them take their eyes off of Jesus and then the body suffered. 
They also treated their spiritual gift of tongues as a hall pass for sin. One of the things that they were doing was mixing pagan rituals, the pagan ritual of prostitution with Christianity. And then they were using their spiritual gift of speaking in tongues as proof that the Spirit of God was on them. And so they were forgiven and somehow they were allowed to do whatever they wanted then. It was their permission to sin. And the body suffered at this distorted thinking and their sinful behavior. Jesus's forgiveness is not a hall pass to sin. Just like my wife's forgiveness to me isn't permission for me to treat her poorly again. The truth is, yes, Jesus died for our sins. Even the ones that we do on purpose. But only discuss what we are saved from misses what we were saved into which is life and freedom. If we continue to cling to our sinful nature, we miss the life that Jesus came to provide. Life which is meant to set us free. Life which is is meant to change our hearts and life that is meant to build the body. Clinging to sin does neither of those things. Jesus says in John 10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Several years ago, my grandmother passed away, and she was uh, 80, uh, 96 years old when she passed away. And um, She had fallen several times uh, in the previous years, and she had broken some bones in her 90s, and every time had recovered, and we were always amazed. She was a, a tough old farm girl, so nothing was going to keep her down, even at 96. But when she was 96, she fell again. And she didn't break any bones. She was just really beat up and bruised up. And um, she, w- she went into the hospital to recover. And I, I went and visited her and she was doing really good. Uh, we were pretty convinced she was gonna recover like she did every other time. This fall was less significant than most of the ones that she had had. But it became clear after a week or two that um, and even though she looked like she was getting better, there was something wrong. And it turned out that she had a uh, perforated bowel and the fall had, had, had torn her bowel. And um, if you know anything about a perforated bowel, it means that she was going to require surgery. And the doctors were pretty sure at 96 years old that she wasn't going to make it through the surgery. But if she did make it through the surgery, the recovery was going to be long and it was going to be hard. And even if she did make it, there would be tubes that would be hanging out of her and it would be not a great quality of life, and she probably wouldn't make it much longer anyway. And so the decision was made, the family made the decision that they would let her go. And the doctor assured us that it would be, you know, a fairly easy, pain-free death, one that most of us would probably choose. And so we decided to let her go. And I remember we went and visited her one night in her hospital room, and she was sick. We knew she was sick at that point. She had taken a turn for the worse. She was pale and weak. And we spent time as a family with her, joking and laughing and sharing stories. She was so looking forward to the birth of our third child, our daughter Capri. Because her birthday was in September and Capri was supposed to be born in September. And so we have a picture of her with her hand on Michelle's belly uh, in August. And um, uh, she was touching Capri. And we knew she probably wasn't going to make it. We all gave her a kiss and, and said our goodbyes that night. It was late. Uh, I want to say it was late in, the, late in the evening, probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock, and, and said goodbye, and, it, and she went to, uh, to sleep that night and never woke up. And it was a peaceful way to go. But the reason I tell you that story is because nobody who saw Grandma lying in her bed like that, breathing her last breaths, would look at a picture of her there and say, that is what living looks like. I wouldn't show that picture to you and say, this is what my grandma's life looked like. That isn't what living looks like. That's what death looks like when it's knocking at our door. And this is what the Corinthian church looked like. They were lying on their deathbed. They were clinging to death by hanging on to their sinful habits. They thought they were alive, but nobody who looked at them would look at them and say that they were living Where are you hanging on to sin in your life and it's stealing your life from you? Jesus' death made it so that we could have life in our souls, not so that we could fabricate reasons for why we need to hang on to our sin. He came to, to free us from sin, 
The good news of the cross is that the redemption of that which was broken by sin can be mended. Which means that there is life, there is restoration, there is freedom at the feet of Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, your picture doesn't have to be of somebody lying on their deathbed. That's not you. You can have life, freedom, joy. Deal with the sin. It's time to rip the band-aid off. There's more good news in this. One of the beautiful things about living in a courageous community of believers is we are together through thick and thin, which means we are not alone. Galatians 6, 2 says this, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. We recognize that when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And so we carry each other's burdens together. That means we don't take the coward's way out. We don't bury our heads in the sand and pretend that nothing happens. We embrace those who are suffering and we share in it with them. And it takes courage to walk through somebody's suffering with them. Because if you walk through somebody's uh, deep-seated sin and you help them through that, you are going to see suffering and it will affect you. If you walk through suffering, through the loss of a loved one with somebody, you will be affected by that because you will share in that grief and that pain. But in a courageous community, that doesn't stop us. Our allegiance is to Christ, not ourselves. So we suck it up and we head into uncharted territory because we love the body and we understand that we are together through thick and thin. This is the way that God designed it to be, the way community is meant to operate. And this is what we have here at Ellerslie. If you have been battling with sin and you're tired of dealing with it alone, my challenge to you today is that you pray about that and ask who you can talk to about it. Ask God who you should talk to and then follow that up by talking to them about it. If no one comes to mind, I'm sure you can talk to somebody here at church. We have a terrific program as well called Freedom Sessions here. It's brought so much healing and so much freedom to so many people. And it's time, because it's time to embrace the life that Jesus came to give you. Now maybe you're not battling with sin, but maybe you know somebody who's suffering or battling with sin. Pray and ask God how you can help them and then reach out to them. We are a part of this body together, which means we share in the sufferings with one another. We don't shy away from that. I know the first thing you'll think is, I'm going to bury my head in the sand and I'm going to forget this never happened. God came, Jesus came so that we could have life and have it to the full. And if we stick our heads in the sand, it ain't going to happen. This brings us to our la the last part of verse 26, which is when one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Living in a courageous community means what we celebrate our different parts. And when the, one of the parts succeeds, we celebrate with them. And I think of the Oilers when they, when they go and they're going to win the Stanley Cup. We're all sitting there. We're watching it. When they win and the winning goal is scored, we don't just sit there and go, good for them. <laughs> and we also don't sit there and go, well, I wish it was me. Oh, well. No, no. Full-growing men jump up in the air and they hug each other and their tears flowing down their faces and we're celebrating together as fans that this team won, our team. <laughs> that is how celebrating needs to look when one of the members of our body succeeds in the mission. We celebrate with them because we are in this together and just like every Oilers fan knows, it takes all of us pushing together, willing our team to make the win. God has designed us to function with our diversity and unity. Where do you fit in the way God has designed this body to operate? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for our time this morning. We thank you for these words in Corinthians that are teaching us and teach us how to live as a community and God, I pray that you would help stir in our hearts where we might, and your spirit would speak to us on an individual level where we might be able to serve in the mission that you have laid on Ellerslie as we function as a body in many of its diverse parts. And I pray over this body, God, that you would keep us united. You would keep us on track with the vision that you put in front of us and the mission that you've put in front of us. 
In Jesus' name we pray.